it doesn't matter where it's made from. It, it what matters is if it's a quality product. If I want the top tier quality thing, I'm going to go buy John Deere. I'm going to go buy DJI because they are the ones that are doing the research and pumping the money into research instead of pumping the money into lobbyists to fight against their own technology. So that's me. I hope y'all use that. <laughs> that was a good speed, Joe. So today, I get to be on the road hanging out here in uh, the area I live in with Ignition Land Services. First, tell me about how you guys met up because uh, there's a story there. And then, of course, how you got into the business, right? Me and Chris have been uh, friends for a long time. We started back in Tarleton uh, when we went to college together. That's where we met. And we worked at Tarleton State University's uh, Research Center Dairy. We started our business with a little side-by-side -side buggies, doing small acreage, ranch management, that type of stuff. And we uh, saw these DJI Agris drones uh, come into the market. Uh, we had a guy that was uh, selling them to us, actually a good friend of ours, Mason Walker with Osprey Ag Drone Solutions. We actually hired him to do a job for us uh, that we couldn't get into. The field was too wet and we were interested in the drones, but we needed to see one perform and see if it was game changing. and. After about the first 30 acres so that he had sprayed out of the 150 plus acre field, Chris and I turned to each other and I said, uh, this is going to change your life. I was skeptical just prices and all the you know, regulations you have to go through to get to legally operate the drone. And so, yeah, we hired Mason to do that job. And yeah, we both looked at each other and it was like, holy cow. I told him right there, we're gonna we're gonna buy none. Uh, we want one. Started the paperwork process of it. And that's kind of where we're at. We've expanded. We've got multiple drones setting up for multiple trailers. We're covering a lot of ground. It's really created a life for us. These drones have allowed us to uh, feed our families and support our lifestyle. And basically, uh, without these drones, uh, we would have never been able to expand uh, as quickly as we have. It's given us a lot of opportunities, uh, whether it be mapping uh, with an enterprise line or uh, spraying, whether it's ponds, lakes, fruit trees, pastures, treat mesquite, taking care of brush encroachment. They've given us access to a lot of acres that we would have never been able to get a hold of. So, I think a lot of people are calling it the untouched acre because it's it's not what the air tractors get to. And there's no 18-wheelers involved. We're able to support the clients and then be back home for dinner. So there's some cost savings to those smaller operations. Uh, what are some of the other benefits that drones are bringing to, to the farmers? I think it's a, a great opportunity for them to be able to uh, scout fields and get into fields when they're too wet. Maybe they have a ground rig that can take care of their whole entire operation. The drone has become an essential tool uh, for some producers that we have either worked with or sold a drone to. Uh, being able to get in when the ground's too wet. Uh, we've taken care of a lot of corn acres and wheat and uh, milo acres are on the books. For producers, it, it's gonna help not reduce their yield through crop damage of a self-propelled sprayer going through it. Uh, and we've positioned ourselves to be a little bit more affordable than a plane or a helicopter, especially since we can go out and, and treat, you know, 100 acres or so where they just couldn't get to it, the field was too wet or it's got limited access to where a plane or a helicopter can't get into. But that doesn't mean drones are necessarily getting rid of of air tankers and things like that, right? It's not going to replace my helicopter, but it's going to make it safer and, and add another thing that I can go pull out wherever I need to get into a situation that might be pretty sketchy in a helicopter. We generally still caution against night flying, but if you're a big producer or farmer and you know that your field boundaries are correct, um, something cool about the drones is we tell people is once you fly a field and it works, as long as no trees move, you didn't put a new power line in, it's a robot. So if the wind conditions and everything are good and, and maybe nighttime is the only time you can get the work done because the wind's been you know kicking your butt, if the field's safe to fly, the drone just flies it which is pretty cool because that's something that, talking about tool in the toolbox, 
even if you're a, a manned aviation guy, you don't want to fly at night, you can't fly at night. In some circumstances, you can send the drone to go do this work. It's more efficient with that using that robotic enhancement with the drone, um, but just as an operator, how easy, because you, you've done ground spraying and, and then transition to this, just how exactly more efficient has it made you over the ground operation? 400%. That's right. a reasonable number too. Uh, yeah, that's legit. 400% more efficient. We would need to carry thousands and thousands of gallons of water, which made logistics a lot more difficult and made it to where getting the job done was actually a gauntlet. If it was 100 acres, I mean, we'd have to take 1,000 gallons. For example, before we got into this business full-time, the way that the system was working, because we, we've always tried to target the small landowners, and we're not a big row crop outfit. Now we can touch it. But in the beginning, the mission was to like serve the basically underserved, like the guy that wants to get his pastures better for his cattle. No one can touch it because, you know, someone's not going to drive an hour across town to go do 20 acres. They might, but it, they don't make a habit out of it. Yeah. And so we went from the ground rig to now the drone. And it's cool, like the trailers that are behind us in our shop load that with herbicide, fill the water tank up, and you're off to the races. We don't have to go p try to find a pond or say, hey, can you go shuttle this water all day? What are some of the challenges and issues that uh, you've been facing or see coming down the road towards this industry? I think it's accessibility right now. I don't know if that's the right answer. Just being able to get our hands on them to support the industry's needs, which that's been kind of a, a friction point, is we have so much work lining up that if we could go get 10 of them and put them to work, that'd be awesome. I think the other challenge is, is the regulations, not necessarily the regulations, but the timeline it takes uh, to get these things legal. We're talking months and months, but getting a hold of people uh, within the federal government's uh, Federal Aviation Administration has been extremely difficult. Um, it's almost like it's bottlenecked us down uh, there's a Facebook page where everybody's constantly asking, like, hey, when did you submit your stuff? When are you getting it back? And I think that's going to end up hurting us in the industry long term. Uh, you're going to have people operating without the proper paperwork and insurance and everything else under the sun. So that's been a big challenge for us as well. We are about 400 percent of the people out there? Or 77 percent of the drones in the United States uh, that were buried recently is not are not registered. That's a number that we've heard recently. And what's sad about that to me is like knowing the industry, no one's trying to do mischievous things. If you know an ag drone, you're not flying around a neighborhood, you know, trying to spy on people. The things... It's pretty it's impossible with, with that size of a drone. The size of a small car, you know, and, and the battery last long enough to do the job not to fly across town um so none of these people are going i'm gonna go buy a drone and make it illegal and go and do something bad like people are trying to support their families they're trying to support their farms they're trying to protect their crops and they're forced to you know not follow the correct path we always advocate with our clients like you know work towards your exemption i mean like chris was saying he saw an end to it i would try to wrap my brain around how how we were operating at the current time, how were we going to transition from owning a job to owning a business where we're working on the business instead of in the business. And these drones, uh, we got comfortable enough with someone like Cooper. Uh, Cooper is a firefighter in Fort Worth. And when he is not uh, at the station, he's here helping us do whatever. We send him out by himself with equipment and what we're able to pay him is worth his time to be out there, or at least I hope it is. And yeah, but I mean, Cooper, I mean, have you had fun learning about it? Oh yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's a really cool thing. Like if you would have asked me a year and a half ago, if I was going to be flying a drone, spraying herbicides and pesticides, I would have laughed. I mean, that was like before this, like, yeah, when I hear drone, I think of like the little camera drone or something that before I saw one, it was like, I really couldn't really wrap my head around it. And then after seeing one fly and work and everything, that's when it kind of evolved into 
how I look at these today. Like it is a piece of equipment. It is your, it is a tractor. It's a piece of equipment that is able to produce revenue and get the job done. And you're able to cut down on manpower getting the job done. And we're having fun doing it. At least, oh, yeah, at least like I am. It's definitely been cool, like meeting all these landowners and like, it, it's a different kind of clientele. Like we love our row crop jobs and like the production ag, but like meeting all these people that maybe they worked a big corporate job and they moved out in the country and they just want their place to look nice and they don't really know how to do it. Then we're doing work for basically uh, the Soil Water Conservation District and Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, saving them literally millions of dollars of maintenance. And that would not be possible without the drone. So that's going beyond farming. That's helping budgets, budgets, tax dollars, as you mentioned, making things more efficient for them and safer down the line. You mentioned sourcing is a problem, which, you know, of course, we've been dealing with for quite a while. Some of its tariffs. Do you see other impacts with legislation that concern you? Yeah, um, the banning of the drones purely coming out of just not understanding what they're used for. If anybody wanted to look at someone's property, there's plenty of satellites uh, flying around in the air uh, and can be observed that way. Um, those concerns are very illegitimate for me. Uh, I think that it's a tactic that's being used and, and being used because it's easy to communicate with other legislators. I feel like that me as an individual in my business is being personally attacked uh, with the, the, the scare. I mean, I've, I've got half a million dollars in your own sitting out here in the shop and I don't know what's gonna happen to them. Uh, if, if it's something of, as far as they wanna ban them all together, am I gonna be compensated for that? And am, am I, I mean, it's gonna completely destroy my way of life uh, my livelihood, it's going to change my family's course, it's going to change my course with, you know, one of my best friends. And I think that if nobody can understand, you know, just because they raise their hand or push a button on a screen to vote uh, in D.C. or in Austin for us, the stroke of a pen can is going to change a lot of people's lives. Uh, there's full-on operations that are depending on these drones to get jobs done that they weren't able to do, increase production. Uh, so you're gonna see production uh, decreased. Why are we trying to stop them from being used if they're solving immense problems, saving tax dollars? If we're truly about saving and cutting the budget, we're living proof of cutting the budget for an entire district. And that can be expanded to every county, every county and parish across the United States. So that's, that's kind of my take on it. So on a lighter note, then let me ask, where do you see the future of drones uh, in agriculture? The future of drones, I, I really see them, uh, I see them being, if a producer has the volume of acres, I see them having their own drone. I see it getting to that point where it allows that farmer to get off the farm a little bit more uh, and get out and be involved in the community. Uh, or be more involved in his family's life, I think that would help with mental health with producers, uh, not having as much stress, uh, with trying to get a job done, trying to hire somebody else to go do it. I, I think that the autonomy of this is truly uh, going to help the American farmer and the farmer worldwide to be healthier. I mean, talking about mental health and everything, one of the things that producers struggle with is the uncertainty of weather and time. So you might want to go to say your kid's baseball game, but Friday is the only day that's got good weather to spray and now you're stuck doing it versus, you know, you know that this thing's working 24 seven, watching the weather is doing its record keeping, is providing you with reports, doing weekly, monthly, whatever time frame maps, communicating with, you know, kind of the central hive of the farm. And that's where I see it going and I think that's awesome. And if we're going to start limiting this technology and we're going to start, you know, I'm not saying let it go gangbusters and do whatever it wants, but going to the extreme of telling people that, hey, we're going to just ban these outright. We're going to get rid of them outright. We don't care to work with whoever it is that's manufacturing. It doesn't matter if it's DJI, EA Vision, XAG. It doesn't matter where it's made from. It, it What matters is if it's a quality product. 
if I want the top tier quality thing, I'm going to go buy John Deere. I'm going to go buy DJI because they are the ones that are doing the research and pumping the money into research instead of pumping the money into lobbyists to fight against their own technology. So that's me. I hope y'all use that. <laughs> that was a good speech, Joe. That's why we've kind of tried to take a solid step, not really backwards, but like how do we support the industry? And I think that's kind of our next frontier for our business is we're obviously going to keep spraying, but like how do we service the community? I mean, we see people come in and buy drones every other day and, you know, where are they operating? Oh, we're down, you know, down near Brent. 30 minutes that way. And it's like, so it, it's exciting for us because we get to still be a part of it, but we're trying to be the hub, the support network for all these, all these people starting their businesses or supporting their farms. I just uh, hope that the process of getting these products here and, and being able to support them continues to be uh, an active matter on everybody's mind. I don't want it to be just shoved to the wayside. I think these are amazing tools that can solve many different industries' problems. They may not make it just a snap of a finger solve, but it 110% is something that makes some of the larger problems that we face, whether it be in public safety, agriculture, industrial, it makes the job a lot easier, a lot safer. Well, all right. I thank you guys again for uh, letting me come out and uh, harass y'all and talk to y'all. <laughs>